Alright, so Season 5 of Game of Thrones has just wrapped, so let's talk about this entire season of Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, Season 5. Alright, so was this a good season of Game of Thrones? Yes, it was a good season. But, it was the weakest season of Game of Thrones I have seen so far. Which is not a knock against Game of Thrones. When you have Game of Thrones, it's one of the greatest shows to ever be on TV. Each season is so awesome after each season. What season's gonna fall flat a little? Now, FYI, this is not a terrible season. This is a good season. It's just not as good as the first four seasons. Right, so, this season of Game of Thrones is very different from the others. For one thing, King's Landing is not now the most interesting storyline. The first four seasons, you had stuff going on King's Landing. You had Ned Stark. You had Tywin Lannister. You had Tyrion as Hand of the King. You had the Blackwater Bay. This season, you just have to deal with Cersei. And I'm not crazy about Cersei. Now, the, the actress who plays Cersei, she does a hell of a job playing her. I really like, though, how the season began with Maggie the Frog Prophecy. It was very telling of who her character really is. A part they left behind in the books is that you will be strangled by your brother. And that you will die after your kids die. That's why she's always mistrusted Tyrion. This season has some big changes from the books. First, Jaime Lannister, he goes off the Dorne. In the books, he goes to the Riverlands to deal with what's left of the Stark Regimacy in the Riverlands. I was figuring we are going to see more of Blackfish this season, but I guess that might be next season. And also who goes to Dorne with Jamie is Braun. I'm so glad they found some way to keep Braun in the show. Because in the books, Braun disappears after the Tyrion trial. The last season they tried out Jamie with Braun because Tyrion was in jail most of the season. So I'm glad they found a way to make Braun more relevant to the show. In the books, Jamie goes off ill in pain, the King's Justice. Because he can't talk, and Jamie can talk to Illid Payne without Illid Payne not be able to tell secrets. Ron's just as loyal, but he's got to be paid. Now the Dorne storyline. I was not crazy about the Dorne storyline. In the books, since the first time I said it, in the books it's handled a lot better. It's all about Ilara saying who's trying to get rid of Marcella Lannister, or Baratheon. They're Lannisters. And Marcella, she is pretty much the image of Cersei Lannister, but with a lot more of her father's kindness or restraint. Now, I like the Zansakes, but and it felt like the show used them right. And now, the most interesting storyline is what's going on in the North. First, you have Stannis Baratheon. Stannis, he saved the Night's Watch from extinction. And now, he wants to take it in the North so he can take the Iron Throne. In the books, he does it a lot differently. In the books, he gets the Norman support, and goes after Winterfell. This time he just goes after Winterfell and relies on blood magic. I didn't really like that. The one scene that was awesome, though, was Stannis saying, kneel before me, and I will make you Jon Stark. And Jon Snow could have become Jon Stark, Lord of the North, Lord of Winterfell, what he's always dreamed of. But Jon, he's just a good guy. He just cannot do it. He has his father's weakness. John gets named Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and that was cool. Jon Snow was a good leader. But as leader, he had to do some complicated things because winter is coming. It is finally come this season. After warnings of five seasons of Game of Thrones, winter has finally come. So Jon Snow, he tries to get the allegiances of the Wild Lakes. And so he goes to Hardhome. And this was probably one of the best episodes of Game of Thrones ever. We saw rumors. It's stories about Hard Hope in the books, but nothing like this. White Walkers. This is the most White Walkers we have ever seen books or shows. And the rest of the world, they're screwed. As Jon Snow said in the last episode, I was like, I just pray they can't climb the wall. And then here comes one of the more controversial scenes. Jon Snow dying. So this is exactly, almost exactly the way it happens in the books. Is Jon Snow dead, though? No, I don't believe it. There is reasons why Jon Snow cannot die. George R.R. R. Martin said himself, saying, Jon Snow's parentage will affect the outcome of the book. I believe that Jon Snow is the son of Lyanna Stark, Ned Stark's sister, and Rhaegar Targaryen, making Jon Snow the heir to the Iron Throne. He has the best claim to the throne. Don't forget, we saw the Red Lady, Mill Sander. She abandoned Stannis and she returned to the Wall. 
Remember back in Season 3? The wood guy brought back the other guy in the Brotherhood Without Banners back to life. I've said since the beginning, Jon Snow, he is the main character of the show. A song of ice and fire. It's Jon Snow. I think with this storyline, with Jon Snow dying and him being coming back to life, it means he has fulfilled his battles. And now his watch is ended, and if he comes back to life, he owes nothing more to the Night's Watch. Now let's get back to Stannis. Stannis, he's trying to take, take Winterfell. Winter has come, and their men are cold, they're freezing, all the horses are dying. And a red woman says, There is power in King's blood. Sacrifice your daughter, and the Lord of Light will lead you to victory. And you know that Stannis was doing the wrong decision. He knew he was doing the wrong decision. When he sent his his conscience, Devo Seaworth, off to the wall, you knew he was about to make a bad decision. He sacrificed his daughter. It's such a sad scene. And then the snow melts, but half his forces had left. So he did the sacrifice for nothing. It was also that redemption moment with Brian the Tarp, who says, like, I was Keith Guard to Ridley Baratheon. And Stannis like, do it. I've lost anyways. I've lost twice. There's no point in life anymore. Brienne pulls the sword and swings at Stannis. And then the scene cuts. I do not believe Stannis Baratheon is dead. If Stannis is dead, they would have shown his dead body right in there. So I do not believe Stannis Baratheon is dead. Another change of the book is Sansa's storyline. Sansa becomes Jean Poole. In the book, Jean Poole was a friend of Sansa. And she went to, to King's Landing with with the Starks, where they went to uh, King's Landing in, in Season 1. They take Jean Poole. They warp her mind by Littlefinger. And she becomes Arya Stark. Because no one really remembers Arya Stark. And everyone believes Arya Stark is dead. In all honesty, I don't mind the changes. Because it gives Sansa's character something to do. So Sansa is to marry Ramsay Bolton. Ramsay is like one of the worst humans in the show. Worse than Joffrey ever was. I mean, he cut the on Greyjoy's dick off. And this is something I do not understand. So the wedding night. It was actually a good wedding. And then we hear the rape of Sansa. Was it unpleasant? Yes. But what did you expect to happen? Have you not been watching the show? The on Greyjoy's dick got cut off. It's season one. The first scene of the entire season at the end of the last episode. We saw Khal Drogo rape Daenerys Targaryen. It happens. Why does this episode get completely destroyed in the ratings? Because it's happened before. I don't understand that. Now there's also the Cersei storyline. Cersei storyline. Cersei, she thinks she's Tywin Lannister. She thinks she's the true daughter of Tywin Lannister. Now, not even close. She fails miserably. Because she breaks the one rule. You don't give power to the church. If you look at it through our history, when the church has power over the military, the crusades happen. When the Muslims have power, they bomb places. Power in the church is not a great thing in the military mindset. And they go after Marjorie, and they also go after her brother. So Cersei's like, yay, I'm winning. But then they get her. And, uh-oh, Karma's a bitch for Cersei Lannister. Everything she's done to this point, she's pretty much got away scotch free. But now she must pay for her crimes. And she's doomed. And then Cersei, she goes on the walk. They cut her hair to, like, well, my level. And she walks naked to the Red Keep. From the Sep to the Red Keep. Get to yourself, Cersei. Let's get to the best part, Mirren. At Mirren, we have Daenerys Targaryen, she's the queen of the city. But there's a rebellion going on from the nobles of Mirren. She's struggling, she doesn't know how to control the city. She lost one of her king's guards, she lost Barris and Selmy. I do not understand why they killed Barris and Selmy this early. She starts to do some political stuff, she reopens the fighting pits. She marries Sabae she loathes to, to get the graces of the city. In ancient times, when he became... When you came in as a foreign power and ruled a city, it didn't work. But if you dressed up like a pharaoh or something like that, then you would be recognized as a true ruler of the city. 
Which is probably the shortest marriage in Game of Thrones history. Also Tyrion. Tyrion, he is upset that because he killed his father on the toilet. He just, he choked out his love. And Barris tells him, the Westeros needs someone not as gentle as Tommen, but not as ruthless as Stannis. Someone right in the middle, and that's Daenerys Targaryen. And Tyrion goes to Meereen. And Tyrion becomes an advisor to Daenerys. Daenerys and Tyrion Lannister have always been my two favorite characters. Tyrion first, Daenerys second, and then Jon Snow. The two characters have all teamed up. Of course they don't team up for long because Daenerys rides on a dragon and flies away. Daenerys, she finds herself somewhere in the Dothraki Sea. And who comes along? A Dothrak horde. This is the point where I do not know what's going to happen next because after this scene and most of the other characters, we are caught up. With the books. Which tells me one thing. George R.R. R. Martin. Finish Winds of Winter. Also Tyrion is left in charge of Meereen. With Grey Worm and Melisandre. Or the one girl. I forget what her name is. Misandri? I think that's it. And Varys shows up. And are like. Tyrion and Varys are at what they're talking. He's like. If I would do so well with a wide hand of spy network. And Varys is like. If only. And Varys is like. Well it's not like you have any. It's not like we know anyone who has experience control a, a city that's on a civil war with complete thrawn and an ancient city with power of its own. And Tyrion's like, I sure miss you, Varys. Which means we're going to see Tyrion, Varys, Missandra, and Grey Worm rule the city next season. The last bit of storyline I'll talk about, this is it, is Arya. I could do without the Arya becoming a faceless man. The part of it, she was going, Oh, I suck the ass of cuckoos! Arya's having trouble letting go of who she really is and becoming no one. Game of Thrones season 5 is not the best season, but it's still Game of Thrones. So it's still royalty among other TV shows. Compared to the other seasons, it's the weakest season. But I'm going to give Game of Thrones season 5 a 4.3 out of 5. It's a good score, so don't trash me in the comment section below because I gave it a low score. Have you seen Game of Thrones Season 5? What are your thoughts? Comment below, let me know. And as, as always, guys, if you like this video, click that like button. Subscribe to see more. All too easy.